Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to be starting in one minute. Okay. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today um, at this uh, webinar. Um, my name is Patricia Durr. I'm the Chief Executive at ECPAT UK. Um, delighted that so many of you, should, of you could join us. I know um, everybody has lots of pressures and busyness, and, um, and certainly anyone joining us from uh, any of the sectors um, that are impacted um, by this illegal migration bill. Um, it's a really busy, hard time for everybody, and I just want to um, acknowledge that at the start. Um, this event is part of our um, series of events we've got at the moment around Refugee Awareness Month. I know it's Refugee Awareness Week next week, um, and just a show of solidarity, really, um, that we're all engaged with across the refugee and migrant sectors. Our focus is on child victims of trafficking, um, and we are also um, campaigning for care for every child, meaning no matter where a child has come from, how they got here, who they are, um, all children deserve um, their rights to be respected to care and protection under both international and domestic law. Um, we're also fundraising at the moment, but I'm pleased to say we, we hit our target this week for our Champions for Children campaign, which is great, but you can still donate. So um, in true Ecpat UK fashion, we're, 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 we're not great at asking for money, but if you can support us in any way, shape or form, we'd be really, really grateful. The, um, the doubling of donations now, um, that that kind of funding has ended, but all funds that you give to us will be um, will support our work, which is great. Um, it's a really critical time for child protection in the UK, for how we treat victims of trafficking and exploitation, and also how we treat um, those seeking um, safety here, seeking asylum and refugees. Um, and if you, every time we talk about this matter as a team and across the sector, we all get very upset about what's happening. Um, I'm really pleased that our Laura Duran is going to talk us through some of the main provisions and how they impact the children and is joined. We're really grateful for Marika Woodman from the Children's Society who's also joined us today. Um, and alongside um, our 
Temi Adekoya, who's our participation and support officer, who's going to talk about some of the conversations we've been having with young people around this bill. But like I say, it's, it can be very upsetting um, and can be quite triggering. So ways to get in touch with us through this um, uh, workshop, uh, sorry, webinar are through the Q&A. Um, and there are a number of us here that can help and support. And there will be an opportunity at the end for a bit of a question and answer session. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, just a little reminder, I won't dwell on this too much about what we do as an organisation at FPAT UK. Um, our vision is that all children enjoy their rights to protection and to lives free from trafficking and exploitation, which I always say is not much to ask really, but it feels like a huge mountain to climb. Um, we do this with an integrated model um, that uh, focuses on direct work with young people, as well as training and practice and development with organisations, practitioners on the ground, evidence-based research and um, development of public policy. And we are unashamedly a campaigning organisation. Um, we know there's a lot that needs to change to make things better for children and young people. And we do all that with our approaches trauma-informed, it's rights-based and it's child-centred um, and all of that is really important to us in how we approach everything we do. So um, without further ado I'm going to um, hand over to Laura Duran, our Head of Policy Advocacy and Research. Um, over to you Laura, thank you. Thanks so much Patricia and thank you everybody for joining us. So some of you may already be working in on this bill and trying very hard to try to at least mitigate some of the horrific damage that this bill will cause. Um, for those of you that haven't been able to familiarize yourself so far with the bill, I'm just going to cover some of the key parts that um, we think are some of the most harmful for children. I'm not going to go into detail um, two of those because uh, Marika is really kindly going to present them in a little bit more detail, but in a nutshell, um, what the government is intending to do with this bill is that they want to give themselves really wide powers to remove children before they turn 18 when they are from a safe country or to reunite them with family. Some of the, you that work with uh, within immigration and asylum law will know that these powers are actually already available to the Home Secretary um, if they can uh, prove um, under policy that the child being uh, returned to their country before they turn 18 will receive uh, safe arrangement conditions, safe reception. That's really a power that has never been fully exercised so far, or in many cases, there have been attempts in the past, particularly um, to establish this threshold for Albanian children. And before uh, we left the European Union, there was uh, use of this, particularly for children from EU member states. Um, we're not entirely sure how much wider this is going. We suspect that what this will mean for children who are unaccompanied before they turn 18 is that they it, it will just make it easier for the Home Office to seek to return them before they turn 18. And this is particularly going to be affecting um, children who are in those safe country lists as uh, amended in the bill, particularly Albanian children. Uh, so from a social work perspective, this can present a lot of uh, different sets of issues, particularly because of the duties and obligations of local authority. Um, if they are uh, meant to facilitate these types of returns and the risk that these poses to the particular child. There's um, very little confidence in some of the risk assessments carried out in country, um, very poor quality uh, social work assessments that have been conducted in the past in this area from other cases known to ECPAD that led to children being re-trafficked, 
um, retrafficking is often not really even considered in a lot of these assessments. So this is a this is a big concern um, for children, particularly when we're talking about Albania Albanian children, given they are so disproportionately represented in those identified as potentially trafficked as children through the national referral mechanism. Uh, in addition to this, they, the Home Office also wants to give themselves the power to, well, they're giving themselves the duty to remove all unaccompanied children when they turn 18 and they will be refusing their possibility to claim asylum or to lodge a human rights claim. Marieke is going to go more into depth on this. Um, there's been um, a lot of work going on behind the scenes, so I'm not going to dwell on this particular bit, but it is one of the most, one of the most horrific things that this bill is doing, basically leaving all these children in limbo. The Home Office is also wanting to give themselves power to accommodate unaccompanied children directly. And these children won't be accommodated during that time by um, children's services. Under these clauses, the Home Office is also giving themselves power to remove children from local authority care to facilitate their removal before they turn 18. So what I just talked about a minute ago, and they're giving themselves additional powers around the information that the Home Office can ask children's social care around these children to facilitate those removals. As some of you may know, um, the Home Office has been accommodating children themselves in hotels since uh, the summer of 2021. This has been something that um, ECPAT UK and many other organizations in the sector have long been decrying because children accumulated in these hotels are uh, not technically accepted as looked after children in the area where they're staying. The Home Office has had no authority to accumulate these children and obviously they have um, no experience to be able to protect children because they're not a child protection agency. They are an agency um, that, it, that functions to enforce uh, immigration, uh, for immigration enforcement and policing. So it is not surprising that this has resulted in a really large number of children going missing from these hotels. Um, over 400 have gone missing. And to this day, over 140 54 children remain missing. Um, this is something that some of you may have seen. ECPAD has decided to litigate um, for. We uh, have launched a legal challenge. I, I can't talk too much in depth about what that challenge means, uh, but you can definitely check out in our website for more information about that. But we really thought it was very important to make sure that children in this limbo can uh, have a way of their um, duties and obligations being exercised um, under the Children Act. So in this case, we are um, uh, challenging the decisions of both Kent County Council and the Home Secretary. But obviously, uh, despite this case that we're bringing, this still leaves us with uh, this horrible provision in the illegal migration bill by which the Home Office is trying to give themselves these powers directly through primary legislation. And it is really unclear how children accumulated by the Home Office will be able to access their rights and entitlements under part three of the Children Act. Um, in this bill, they also want uh, to have the ability to detain unaccompanied children for longer than what is currently in law, which is 24 hours, um, and accompany children for 72 hours. Mariek is also gonna cover these 
absolutely horrific developments in this bill around child detention and what they mean. Um, this is uh, an area where we did see a lot of progress from the conservative government and is really distressing that now we're moving backwards towards um, unlimited child detention. Um, and then uh, finally, another area that this bill completely attacks is uh, the system for identification of victims of trafficking under the nationality uh, under the national referral mechanism. Some of these provisions have already been significantly limited with the passing of the Nationality and Borders Act of 2022. As we said then during the passage of that act, that legislation has made it even more difficult for children to be identified as victims. Um, many of you who are supporting children through the NRM have probably noticed the, the radical changes in decision making at the first stage of the decision, which is the reasonable grounds, and how challenging getting positive decisions has become and the significant decrease in positive decisions in the latest statistics. Beyond that, the Nationality and Borders, Borders Act also very controversially sets out to disqualify um, victims of trafficking under certain categories for uh, criminal offenses. We, alongside our colleagues in the Children's Society, significantly challenge this, particularly given that we know that most children are identified for uh, criminal exploitation as the uh, primary form of exploitation in the UK. And given that many children who are exploited for criminality are facing and being convicted for criminal offenses, this is a really dangerous precedent that now these children are potentially disqualified from receiving protection in that previous legislation. The illegal migration bill goes even further and now seeks to disqualify children who are foreign nationals if they have any length of a custodial sentence. Uh, so, be, so in the Nationality and Borders Act, that would have been for uh, a, a certain amount of time the custodial sentence was served. Now it's any custodial sentence can disqualify a child. In addition to this, the illegal migration bill is going to leave a huge number of children significantly at risk because it removes the rights, for example, of accompanied children who are victims or who are the children of victims to be able to access safe houses, financial support or other entitlements as they arise under ECAD that in the past through policy would have been given to potential victims entering the national referral mechanism. Now they are just subject to removal straight away and won't be able to receive any of those entitlements. We really fear the harm that this, cause this can cause to many children and families uh, in absence of being able to avail themselves of this protection. It also disqualifies them from the very limited forms of immigration leave that they could have accessed before as victims of trafficking once they were found to have been conclusively so. Um, now uh, disqualifying them from that altogether once again and making them subject to removal. So that is this, um, legislation in a nutshell with regards to some of the worst, most horrific harms it does to children. Um, some people have been asking this question quite a bit. Um, why is the government doing this? Uh, to be honest with you, we've really struggled to understand why any of these measures are uh, necessary. The government says that these really cruel measures need to be enacted as a quote unquote deterrent to stop people coming in small boats. Um, it's very clear that not only that this bill go much further than just people arriving in small boats, pretty much everyone in the sector is in agreement that this will really do nothing uh, to be able to protect people from really dangerous uh, irregular migration and it's just going to 
leave people in really serious um, precarity and subject to more exploitation with many calling it a traffickers charter. Um, the government also keeps saying that there are large numbers of people abusing the national referral mechanism. This is unfortunately a line that many people uh, keep um, adopting from the government, despite the fact that uh, I would say pretty much everybody in the anti-slavery sector has, including UK, has consistently say from day one when we first heard this in the Sun newspaper from Priti Patel that there's absolutely no evidence to show that there's wide scale abuse of the national referral mechanism. The system is designed to determine whether somebody is a victim or not. So if a really small number of people seek to abuse it, then they will be determined not to be a victim. Uh, but there's absolutely no reason to put so many people at risk of harm when there is absolutely no evidence to support this government position. For children specifically, they say that they can't make any exceptions for children within this bill because what they're actually trying to do is to protect children from taking dangerous journeys. Um, to us, this has been really shocking that the government seems to think that they are protecting children by being really cruel to them. But <laughs> that's, that's the logic that they are using. They also say that they can't do any um, exclusions, exclusions of children from different aspects of this bill because they say that many adults are claiming to be children. Um, again, all the data that we have so far shows that this isn't true. There may be a small number of adults claiming to be children, but by far what we have seen the biggest issue uh, being many children actually being treated as adults by port authorities and subsequently placed in really significant harm when dispersed into adult, adult asylum seeker accommodation and or um, in immigration detention subject to removal. Um, the crux of the matter is we just think this is completely political. They think that this will help them in the upcoming election. Um, so What is ECPAT UK saying? Obviously the main point that we keep hammering on is that this bill breaches international law, that um, it's running counter to domestic law with regards to children, particularly the Children Act, that as I mentioned before, the bill is very cruel and it will harm really huge numbers of children, that they will be in limbo forever, um, that it's inhumane, the treatment that they will be subject, subjected to. And that this, this is a traffickers charter because it will mean that many more people, including children, will be exploited and they won't want to come forward to public authorities. I hope that explains everything. Obviously, if you have any other questions, please do pop that into the chat, but I'm gonna pass it on now to Marieke so she can touch on those points around child detention and inadmissibility. Thanks, Lara, and thanks, Patricia. Yes, hi, I'm Marika Woodman. Um, I'm the Policy and Practice Advisor for Refugee and Migrant Children at the Children's Society. Um, and as Laura's been mentioning, Laura's been mentioning, um, this bill rolls back many protections that exist for ch children seeking safety in the UK. And in fact, it does away with many of those protections. And as she mentions, there's two that I'll focus on today, just going into a little bit more depth. Those are both around inadmissibility, which is effectively the right to claim asylum, and around child detention. Um, next slide. I think what's important to say at the very outset is, all the media focuses on the small boats, small boats bill it's called and everything else. But this bill affects anyone arriving in the UK that arrives now through what is not what the government deems a safe and legal route. 
So there's certain programs that the UK has had where uh, a person can come directly from the country they're fleeing, but those are very, very limited. The most recent one has been with Afghanistan, and we've been aware that very few people have been able to come through that. Um, so, but this bill would affect everybody coming any other way. Um, and mostly for young people and unaccompanied children, they will have to come through means that aren't safe and legal. Um, safe Passage, another organization had done research looking at the number of children who arrived between 2010 and 2020, and only 6% had been able to arrive through safe and legal routes, despite almost a vast majority having their claims recognized. Um, so what's important to set out is the way in which this bill works, and I've set out here, there are four conditions. Um, and as I said, it's just simply that you didn't arrive through a safe and legal route. So what the bill sets out is that you arrived and you didn't have the documentation to arrive. You don't have a visa or something else. You can't claim asylum with a visa, but you did have a means of actually arriving here and being uh, recognized at port of entry. Two, you arrived on or after the 7th of March of this year. That was the date the bill was tabled. So anyone who's arrived through some of these processes after the 7th of March today, uh, this year, this bill would affect them. You've not arrived directly from the country you were fleeing. So you didn't arrive directly from Afghanistan or Syria. You've arrived obviously having to go through another country as well. And you don't have the documentation to stay. So that means this will affect anyone coming through a lorry, um, about any means, it's not simply small boats. Um, then as Laura set out, that means if you meet those four conditions, the Secretary of State will have a duty to remove you. If you're an unaccompanied child, they have a duty to remove you once you reach 18 or they have a power to remove you before. Now, the other aspect is, is if you meet those four conditions, the bill sets out that any claim you make to asylum protection or a human rights claim you would make is not admissible, which is basically legal speak for saying they won't consider your claim. You could fill out the paperwork, but basically they won't consider it. Um, it won't go through the process, it just, it, it won't go anywhere. So effectively you have no ability to, acclaim, to claim asylum. We've seen admissibility uh, policies before. So under the Nationality and Borders Act, there was also an admissibility process um, and it's the basis for removal. It was a basis for the Rwanda scheme. If you can't make a claim to asylum, they can't consider it, they can't recognize that you actually do need protection, they'll remove you. Um, the difference was is in the past and under the past scheme with Rwanda, if you had been here for more than six months, they would consider your claim. At that point, they would recognize that they needed to consider your claim and decide whether you did need to be protected. The other big issue is, for children, unaccompanied children, that they've always been exempt from these policies. So when we had the Nationality and Borders Act and there was a, an admissibility policy for up to six months, they explicitly excluded unaccompanied children, recognizing the negative impacts this has. So basically at this point, they're saying in this bill, no matter if you're an adult, a child with a family or an unaccompanied child, you cannot make a claim of asylum if you meet those four conditions. Um, that is really problematic because we know in looking at the grant rates last year, many children come from Afghanistan, where basically effectively we are recognizing 100% of their claims to asylum. Those coming from Sudan, um, the claim rate was 96%. For those from Eritrea, we recognized 99% of the claims from children, unaccompanied children coming from those countries. And then last year, in total, looking at all the claims of unaccompanied children, um, more than 86% of those were recognized and they received protection. So basically what we're saying now is if you come as an unaccompanied child, you might be coming from one of these countries, we fully recognize you would have, you know, you need protection. Um, nonetheless, the policy is now, if you didn't come through a safe and legal route, we're not even gonna consider whether you need protection, we're simply gonna deem your claim inadmissible. Um, and as I said, what's quite stark is the fact that in the past, the government's very been very explicit that making claims inadmissible for unaccompanied children is a step too far. They said in the last, in the guidance, that unaccompanied children could not be subjected to this. They've said in the past, you know, they couldn't apply to unaccompanied children because of the negative impacts. But with this bill, they appear to have changed their minds. Now, it's obviously very likely that this policy is going to be challenged. 
Um, it's being challenged currently as it goes through the par as a bill goes through Parliament. Many raising concerns about this, saying this, our duties to children have not changed. Why would we change our stance on this? Um, nonetheless, the government is still uh, pursuing this proposal. Um, so what that will mean is that if the bill passes later this summer, what it will mean that any child who's arrived unaccompanied after the 7th of March this year will not have their asylum claim admitted or considered. Um, and what this could mean, as we were talking about, um, at present, the Secretary of State wouldn't have a duty to remove them un until 18. So you could have a child arriving who is arriving seeking safety from a country such as Afghanistan, Eritrea, or elsewhere, any country where we know most likely they do have a claim for protection, they'd not be able to have that claim considered uh, or decided upon. You can't appeal that decision that it's inadmissible. And, but nonetheless, we've recognized that they most likely could stay unless the Secretary of State uses her powers to remove, but they could stay until they were 18. So government has said they will get some type of potential temporary leave but this means they're coming here and they don't have a recognized claim for protection. They would have a temporary status um, until they reached adulthood. Um, what this definitely will mean is that for children coming in now, um, while these policies will be challenged, in the meantime, um, obviously being left in limbo will affect their physical and emotional well being. So there's definitely a need to support them as they try to sort out what is happening in the state they've been left in and as kind of the asylum system potentially changes as well um, for what is being proposed now and maybe in the future um, once these things are challenged. Um, next slide. The other aspect, and I feel like I'm all gloom and doom because it's nothing's very positive here. <laughs> the other aspect is child attention. Um, as Lara was mentioning, there reversing past commitments. So prior to 2010, um, children within families and unaccompanied children could be detained. At that time, there was a complete outcry and big public campaigns because people began to see the dire impacts that detention was having upon children. Um, it affected their physical health, they lost weight, um, they couldn't sleep, it obviously affected their emotional well-being, we know that children were traumatized further. Um, they obviously always saw it as a very institutional setting. Um, and they wondered why they had pla been placed in such a place which they would otherwise have deemed would be for people who were bad. So children were quite traumatized by it. Um, we saw um, many withdrew. Um, they suffered from um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Some became suicidal. So as a consequence, obviously there was a large outcry about this and um, which garnered a lot of public support. So in 2010, pol politicians began committing to ending the use of child detention for immigration purposes. And we saw David Cameron ma make this commitment if he became PM. As he did, it then became um, part of the coalition manifesto and they made a commitment to end child detention for immigration purposes. They changed the policy in 2011 and in 2014, they changed the law. Now move forward to 2023, and a conservative government has decided that they're going to undo these commitments that were made in the past and the restrictions that were placed into law. Um, so as Lara mentioned, at present, the law states that an unaccompanied child cannot be held for longer than 24 hours in a short-term holding facility, um, and that a child within a family can't be held for more than 72 hours or up to seven days with the personal authorization from a minister. Under the illegal migration bill, it sets out that anyone can be held indefinitely anywhere that the Secretary of State decides is appropriate, which means both the time restrictions and the locations restrictions are being removed. This, as Lara has mentioned, has caused a lot of pushback, um, particularly also within the conservative um, members of the, uh, both houses. Um, many who are obviously questioning why a conservative government would roll back on its past commitments, also questioning why we would turn back the clock and go back to policies that were in place previously and we saw the dire consequences of those policies. Um, the one concession the government has currently made is that they have set out that they may um, 
have future regulations which will set out the circumstances whereby unaccompanied children can be detained. These may include time restrictions, but all of this has been left to the future. And so there's no concrete um, commitment that's been made as far as any restrictions on how long a child could be detained or where they could be detained. Um, again, this is a proposal which if it's not, if it's passed and not amended further, and there are currently several amendments that are going through the House of Lords, um, and which will then go back to the House of Commons, and we expect there should be some concession. But again, it might just be this future concession of there will be time restrictions at some time and place for unaccompanied children, but nothing set in stone yet. Um, it is likely that this, if that goes forward, this will be challenged most definitely in the courts again, um, because we know the impacts it will have. Um, and also because as many people have pointed out, simply the policies in this bill are not workable. So it's likely once they are put into place and they pe begin implementing them, they might see that this is not all feasible. But nonetheless, on the books, if it's passed as it is presently, this means that we could see unaccompanied children and children within families detained once again, which as those working with children will have big impacts for those children. It's something to be aware of. We are likely to see children who are even further traumatized now and have many of those symptoms and impacts that I had mentioned previously that we saw in the past. Um, so I leave on that very happy note and I'll pass back to Lara and Pat. Oh. Thank you so Sorry, much. Sorry, I was gonna jump in. <laughs> Sorry, Lara, I do apologize. Um, but just to say thank you to both of you, that's what I wanted to say, um, because I know you've been, I mean, we, both organisations, the Children's Society and EPAC UK and many others, you know, we're, they're strength in numbers and we all work together in the Refugee and Migrant Children's Consortium, um, just really important to, to come together and, and work hard. And I know you two both personally have been working very hard along with the, along with other um, members there. So thank you. And it's good to talk a little bit about some of the potential movement. And maybe I know it's not, but I know it's grim. It's not very much, but um, I know we've got a question about that, which we'll come back to at the end. If, if we can come back to you both, that'd be great. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to our participation support officer, um, Temi. Um, Temi is, has been doing lots of work uh, with our youth advisory group, which is uh, a group of um, 12 young people who come together every month and really um, help to shape um, our work uh, um, and our priorities for moving forward. And um, we talk to them about what's current and obviously this is current. It's been hard, um, but Tammy's gonna just tell us about some of the responses, reactions, thoughts, feelings about all of that from our youth advisory group. Thank you, Tammy. Hi guys, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you for um, for everyone that contributed for this event to take place. And getting the feedback that we got from our young people, I was I call it their reaction to this. And some of it is, is what I will be talking about today. And one of the questions some of the young people were asking was something that we have no correct answer to. And one even mentioned that um, actually this is really shocking. Even though I'm still on this process, but I can wrap my head around around the the bill and also that went in details. Like I'll give you an example. Where is human right? Where is human rights, children rights in this bill? United Kingdom is one of the greatest activists for human rights. And they even fought other, other governments, other countries, I mean by that, to follow human rights, to think about it in their policy, in their behavior towards others. 
and it's shocking to get this bill passed, put forward by the UK government. And they went on by saying, we are a child that needs support. We are children that need safety. We are children that need to be cared for. This also is something that um, young people discuss in group, in our advisory group. And that when the other one that I would like to bring forward was, um, this bill is, is inhumane because um, we can't say anything that talk about um, the need of the young people and the children. And they went on discussing the challenge that is faced already on day-to-day -day basis, on following the process of asylum claim, the NIM, everything, the whole process itself is, it gives them nightmare. And then having this type of bill on top of it, um, they say it's a killer. They say it's like something that they, it's actually something that one of them was like, I don't think I can even think of anything else that can be worse. Where a government is saying that I'm not important because by putting something on that come out on this bill, that is this something that I'm not getting or understanding. But after getting more info from the ECPAC staff, because on our on our youth, on our advisory group, we also invite our policy manager to come in to update the young people on what is current. And it was like, so it's very much very clear now what is being said is what I'm reading. Right to, right to work, the young people say, the only thing I can say in this um, government new bill is, is drawing all, all attention on the negative part. They're not looking at the positive impact that this uh, us as young people have on the country. We are young people who are ambitious and very determined, looking forward for a bright future and preparing to work hard to reach it. We're not looking for and, and out or easy life because it's not easy, but we are still hoping for the best. This bill shut every door because it's not giving us opportunity to even try to make it in life. Our future is shattered because we're not even given opportunity to make attempts to get a better future. And some of these stuff that I highlight out is to look at the 18. When they say 2018 means that you can be removed or even prior to you being 18. And they, they said, and I quote, does this mean that I'm not important because I'm 2018? Or does it mean that being 18 is a bad thing? And go on, no protection no future. Giving traffickers the most prominent and powerful power to make it more invisible for young people to continue to be abused, neglect, and exploited. Because now there is no way out. The only way out is like a death sentence because the only person that is available that is not even healthy 
is the trafficker. They're making it impossible to gain freedom. How do we come out of this? And they said, somebody help. They even used the quote, see it, do something about it. Every little help that this should not be allowed to pass through. It's inhumane, it's not child friendly, it's not something that is looking at the future of the young people and children that will be faced and be forced to move to where they don't know or have a clue of what their destination is, is happening all over again. Coming to the UK was not a plan that I know of. I'm just following the leader. Now I'm here again. You're saying that I'm, there's no space for me. Where do I belong? Where is that safe place? I am the only one that know where I'm safe because there's no one else to trust with my safety. That no further do. Thank you guys. Thanks so much, Tammy. Um, really powerful testimony from um, young people who know exactly what they're talking about. And um, thank you for sharing that so well with all of us. Um, it's, yeah, and this is why it's also very painful, I think, all of these measures. Um, the young people that form, part, form our youth advisory group are um, child victims of trafficking who have come through a system that was already very difficult for them with many challenges. But for them, thinking about, as you've, as you've told us so powerfully, Tammy, um, about what it will be like for children arriving after the 7th of March and making a comparison between their, at least some recourse to their rights and entitlements in our current system has been really hard for all of us, I think. Um, and it, it's the powerful message we really want um, government to hear and to listen to, and we will keep on together making those making those that, that case um just to explain as well we had hoped that members of the youth advisory group would join us today but um uh, in really good news they, they've all got very busy lives <laughs> they've got jobs they're studying um they've got interviews so um so we're really grateful to you Temi, for kind of pulling all of their words together in that way it's really helpful but we're delighted that they can't be there in some in some weird way because <laughs> they're doing great things more power to them um so that's the end of our presentations we've come to our questions and answers i've got loads um but it's not about me um but there are some questions um, that have come through on the q a um and i think uh, if i can ask you lara to to start so some of them are about um, the process, the parliamentary process and the passage of the bill. Um, I know Marike um, focused on some of that, um, but if you could just kind of bring us up to speed as to where we're at, because um, certainly one of our participants is concerned about how rapidly it's been running through Parliament. I think we're all concerned about that. Um, so timeline, and then the second question, which maybe but both you and Marike can answer is about what, the, coming back to this possibility for um, any change um, that, that may be coming down the line. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, the speed by which this bill was introduced and the speed by which it's making its way through both chambers is, in my experience, unprecedented. Um, it, it, it has been been truly shocking to see um, this bill land without any form of pre-legislative scrutiny. Um, the way it was rammed through the House of Commons, not even having a specialized committee, but committee of the whole house, which actually made it really, really challenging to even 
uh, um, you know, conduct any sort of scrutiny or assist uh, parliamentarians through that process to try to raise some specific issues um, with regards to the impact that this bill will have. Um, it's been slowed down a tiny bit in the House of Lords just because government has a little bit less, well, they have less control altogether of the timetable, um, but they're still ramming it through in um, a few of the latest stages at committee, they make uh, peers stay until four in the morning um, during one session and until two in the morning in the next session just now in committee. So it, it's been truly shocking. Um, with regards to timelines, I think the government expects that they will be able to pass this into law before summer break. That's the intention from government. Um, we hope not. <laughs> Maybe Marieke has a little bit more insight about the possibility that they want, but that is definitely what they're trying to do. Um, I'm going to let you jump in now, Marieke, if you want to talk more about, um, I guess, the procedural stuff, and then we can come back and discuss some of the amendments we're working on together. Sure. Um, but I think, Lara, the point you were just making, yeah, they want to have it done by summer research, which is July 20th. So. Um, it'd be great if we could extend the time on this, but it's looking like they are forcing the hand of everybody else. Um, so it's come out of committee. It'll be in um, the next stage in the House of Lords will be at the end of June, beginning of July, and then it would be done in the House of Lords um, by July 11th, and that would go between the two houses. So it'd be very quick, um, but I think that's the way they're putting their pressure on. Um, so yes, I think we're all anticipating by, by the summer, unfortunately, but we'll see. Um, as far as amendments, do you wanna go ahead, Lara? Yeah, so as far as amendments, we're working um, really strongly as a coalition of the refugee and migrant children sector. Um, we, the priorities I identified at the beginning are the priorities we've been raising throughout the bill. Um, in addition, we've also been discussing to uh, amendments that the government made at the end of um, scrutiny in the House of Commons around age assessments, which I didn't go too much into depth on, uh, but that is uh, a, an additional concern with, with regards to this bill. Um, at this stage, we are trying to continue emphasizing all of these issues for children, but we are not very hopeful about concessions we might get from the government besides what Marieke identified. There is quite a lot of opposition around child detention. Um, I think somebody else asked in the questions about Lord Dubs. So um, I think one of the most important amendments um, uh, alongside the, the, the amendment we're championing around child detention um, was tabled by Lord Dubs during uh, committee stage. And it's an amendment that at the very least is just trying to keep the status quo around inadmissibility for unaccompanied children so that even if all this uh, other horrible stuff is happening, at the very least, we can try to protect their right to claim asylum and have their asylum claim heard. Um, but Mariakis has been working really closely with uh, RMCC and Safe Passage on that bill. So I'll pass on to you so you can share maybe some of your observations so far around that. Yeah, so it is true. Lower Dubs, where he's putting his a lot of his focus on is around this inadmissibility for unaccompanied children. So he's had some pieces in the media and he's doing his best to strum up some um, further support around it. Um, and he'll continue to do so as it progresses um, and we'll have support from across uh, the house, hopefully, uh, in support of that. Because I think people recognize that this is kind of reversing our past kind of commitments uh, just like with child detention. So hopefully he garners more support um, and we'll continue pushing that. And as Lara said around child detention, 
that amendment has been pushed and is being pushed by conservatives, which is helpful, um, if not for nothing else that they can negotiate with their own government um, on trying to force the issue. So it is being led by three conservatives and a bishop with um, definite uh, uh, support across the house. Um, and as are, there are other amendments on the other issues around accommodation, around age assessments, exploitation. Um, but because there's so many issues in this bill, um, it's just also trying to be realistic on what we can achieve now and what we'll need to push for in guidance and otherwise in the future. Um, but yes, we'll keep pushing those with hopefully some concessions made. Thanks so much both. That's really helpful. And just to say to all participants, we can send you the link to all of the briefings from the Refugee and Migrant Children's Consortium following the event. Um, so you can kind of um, just have a look if you're interested in the detail of some of those. I think um, there's a, you know, a brilliant effort being done to with the sector and with parliamentarians, um, you know, kind of having the House of Lords sit as Laura said until four o'clock in the morning. The reason for that, as it was on the Nationality and Borders Act, was because they wanted to see through the amendments on children specifically. Um, so there is a lot of concern, a lot of opposition. The problem with amendments is it's also awful that we want the bill to be scrapped completely. Um, and so it is it is quite hard to kind of think of ways to improve it. Um, obviously, we all do whatever we can um, to, to keep on. Um, there was one specific question about um, academia. Um, and anything from that. I don't know if you've got anything to, to add on that, Laura? Um, yes, um, I think it, it, always the collaboration with academia when we need additional evidence is so helpful. One of the issues we have currently with the government is that they're not very interested in evidence-based policy. Um, all of even, you know, when the evidence has been crystal clear about the effect of deterrence, about the impact that this will have, the government is just not receptive to evidence, unfortunately. So it's, it's I think we already have really good documentation, for example, on the impact that child detention has on children. We have really good evidence around a lot of the other measures. Um, obviously, we're going to need to be, um, once this bill passes, which we expect it will, we will need to join with a lot of colleagues in academia to start to document the horrific impact this will have. Um, this government won't be here forever, and hopefully we can persuade future governments to, to backtrack a, lo a lot of the harm that has been caused. Um, but at this stage, I can't really identify a specific session where, where I feel like there's a gap of evidence. Um, the problem we have is more, as I said, that the government just doesn't want to listen to it, unfortunately. Thanks so much, um, and thank you to everyone who's attended today. I think the um, the you know the support uh, in in listening to that evidence and listening to the facts is really really helpful. Um, if you can contact your MPs, look your local MP, and kind of raise concerns about this, I know a number of organisations have got direct um, messaging, including the Refugee Council. Um, our youth advisory group has put together uh, a letter that we're hoping to get out to all parliamentarians soon as well, and we'll be in touch with our supporters around that. But there is lots of opposition to this, and I think we've all got to remember that, that there is a strength in those numbers um, all working together. Could you put the next slide on, please, um, just while we end, just in case... Um, anybody um, wants to take down any of these details around particularly maybe our website expat.org.uk there are links on there to all of these issues and our research um, and policy work um, if you can donate anything to us that would be really really helpful there's a barcode there but I'm not sure you can see it maybe my face is in the way I'm not sure what you're looking at <laughs> but um, 
yeah, we, we will continue our work on this bill and we will continue calling for care for every child. And um, just thank you for joining us today and do stay in touch with us um, through whatever means and also our, our friends at the Children's Society too. Thank you for joining us, Mary Kay. Really appreciate it. Thank you and have a great rest of the afternoon. Enjoy the sunshine.